Hey, what's up everyone? So today we're going to cover chapter 2 of Essentials of Strength Training and Conditioning, which is the official book to study with for anyone that is getting ready to take the CSCS exam offered by NSCA. And so let's dive right in. Okay, so the first topic that we're going to discuss is skeletal musculature. Um, this is the basics of the basics, but the book covers it in the very beginning of the chapter, so we're going to go over it relatively quickly. In any movement there is an agonist an antagonist and a synergist and so a, a very easy example is elbow flexion um, when you do a biceps curl for example you're using your biceps brachii as the primary muscle to flex at your elbow and so that is your agonist which is written right here and then your antagonist is whatever muscle um, is opposing that action and so all right sorry let me rephrase that antagonist is whatever is doing the opposite of the primary action and so when you do a biceps curl like i said you're flexing at your elbow so whatever is extending or whatever should extend your elbow which is your triceps is going to be the antagonist in this example and so here is the agonist or prime mover which is the biceps brachii right here antagonist a muscle that does the opposite is trice uh, triceps and then a synergist muscle is whatever assists um, the motion of um, the, the primary motion that we're talking about so in this case we're talking about biceps curls um, this is elbow flexion like we talked about and so um, here you can see the brachioradialis muscle um, that helps with um, elbow flexion three different kinds of levers in our body and the first type is um, it's a seesaw so basically let's uh, look at this picture right here so the fulcrum you can see the fulcrum is in the middle and then resistance on one side and um, muscle action going on on the other side and so it's a seesaw right so um, just remember for the first one um, it's a seesaw and so neck extensor works this way as a first um, lever in our body our head is the resistance that neck extensors need to work to keep up with and so if the neck extensors are not working here our head is just gonna tilt this way we don't want that and so neck extensors need to work and contract in order for our head to stay upright and so the fulcrum is right in the middle resistance on one side uh, muscle action on the other side and so that's is the first type of lever um, second type is much simpler i think um, think of a wheelbarrow for the second type of lever or second class lever when you have fulcrum at one end so as opposed to seesaw where you have fulcrum in the middle now you have the fulcrum at the end and so if you imagine a wheelbarrow um, you have the wheel in the front and then you have this thing where the, uh, it carries um, the load in here there's like stuff in here and then you pull on the other end of where the fulcrum is and so if you think about the plantar flexors um, when you do a heel raise when they contract the fulcrum or whatever is stationary is on one end of our foot um, where the toes are like it shows in this picture here um, the resistance is going to be in the middle between the fulcrum and where your muscle contracts and finally um, the, the energy or where the muscle is acting on is going to be on the other end of the uh, fulcrum uh, in a linear line and so think of a wheelbarrow uh, when you pick up a wheelbarrow on one end the fulcrum which is the wheel is going to be on the other side so that is the second class lever and now let's talk about third class lever biceps and so now third class second class fulcrum is both at the end of a line if you think of it as a linear line and so you can see that the fulcrum is on one end but now instead of the resistance or whatever you have to 
keep up with being on being closer to fulcrum now it's on the opposite side and so here's the biceps um, elbow flexion example again um, let's think about doing a biceps curl with a 25 pound dumbbell um, you're going to hold the dumbbell on one end right and then your fulcrum is going to be on the other end and your biceps is going to be in between that and so third class lever um, think about biceps curls where fulcrum resistance is on each end and then the muscle action is going to be um, in between that all right so moving on to moment arm and mechanical advantage um the most simple way to think about this i, I really like this diagram or this picture here um you measure the distance between the fulcrum which is here and the perpendicular distance of where the force is um, being acted on and so here's this little kid um, and you measure the perpendicular distance and so this right here is going to represent the moment arm okay so the farther away you're from the fulcrum the bigger or um, greater force you can exert um, because of that distance even though the mass um, like you can see in this diagram the, the little kid is smaller than this big guy um, is the, the mass is different okay so like I said this distance um, you go perpendicular and you measure the distance to the fulcrum is going to represent your uh, moment arm and we can talk about the patella example shown here um, patella is a great example of how our body kind of adapted over the years over centuries um, to give that knee joint and the extensor muscles mechanical advantage uh, with the patella the, the quad one of the quad muscles can attach farther away from the fulcrum um, where the the action happens and so that like I said the mo longer the moment arm the better mechanical advantage we have and so um, that's the whole purpose and, and a good example of a moment arm in our body all right and mechanical advantage here this just means that the ratio between moment arm of our muscles is bigger than the moment arm of resistance giving us that mechanical advantage like we talked about here um, in the patella example another example um, like this seesaw example is opening a door if you try to open a door near uh, where the hinges are it's harder right but if you increase the moment arm and try to push the door farther and farther away from where the the hinges are it's easier and so that's another good example also important to keep in mind that even though the force may be greater when you increase the moment arm speed isn't necessarily going to be greater if anything the speed is going to decrease if you lengthen the moment arm all right so moving on to some of the basic definitions here we're going to talk about the anatomical planes uh frontal sagittal and transverse there's really no way around um this you just have to know it um and so here we can look at this picture down below as you can see frontal plane is going to divide our body front and back okay so it goes boop like that all right and then sagittal plane is the plane that divides our body left and right and then finally transverse plane is the plane that divides our body up and down and let's talk about acceleration now acceleration measures the change in velocity so even if you're going super fast or super let's just say you're going super fast um, on, on your car um, let's say you're going 120 miles per hour if you don't change your speed and you keep going at 120 miles per hour your acceleration is going to be zero because acceleration is what measures the change in velocity so with positive acceleration you're going to speed up with negative acceleration you're going to speed uh, speed down um, decrease your speed okay uh, we know that force equals mass times acceleration um, these um, concepts that are derived from physics it's not necessary to uh, solve an equation or remember these formulas but having a general understanding of 
um, these concepts definitely help in solving biomechanic uh, biomechanics problems okay and so um, strength and power power I just in included them here because power as you will see in future chapters is usually associated with um, speed and creating um, force in a short amount of time um, so just to keep that in mind next let's talk about biomechanical factors and strength these are the biomechanical factors that contributes to um, our strength and so we're gonna go over them um, neural control um, very important to remember recruitment and ray coding is what determines one of the things that determines our strength and so how many motor units are recruited at a time is what recruitment is and rate coding is the rate at which the motor units are fired okay so th those two things very important to remember all right so the next up is cross-sectional area of our muscle so this is what determines the force the muscle can develop a lot of people think it's the volume of the muscle but it's important to remember that it is the cross-sectional area of a muscle that determines our strength okay and then there is also muscle length um, this has greater force in resting as opposed to when it's contracted and that's because there's a lot more overlap that can happen or is happening when the muscle is lengthened um, the overlap between actin and myosin and that forms cross bridges like we talked about in the last chapter all right uh, we can also talk about the eccentric concentric graph here um, we'll quickly go over eccentric and concentric um, let's keep on going with this example of biceps curls and so when you're doing a biceps curl you're flexing at your elbow and so when you come up you're concentrically contracting your biceps because you're shortening the biceps to perform this action and so when you are going back down you're lengthening the biceps muscle to its original length and that is eccentrically contracting the biceps muscle one very important thing to remember is you can create more you can generate more force uh, when you're eccentrically controlling or contracting the muscle all right and moving on to strength to mass ratio this just um, refers to how athletes that are smaller in mass has a stronger or a uh, better strength to mass ratio compared to athletes that are bigger in mass all right sources of resistance to muscle contraction uh, we all know that gravity is one of the most popular sources of resistance um, it says here less resistive torque when weights are closer to the joints so this goes back to the door example that we talked about earlier when the weight is farther away from the joint that is doing the work it's harder to um, resist that with our muscle and so that's what this is all about and then moving on to weight stack machines another example of how we can provide resistance um, for muscle contraction inertia this can be used in acceleration training so inertia essentially is change in momentum and so changing the inertia and altering it is another form of how we can do acceleration training in sports all right so friction is what is referred to as um, the surface resistance that an object experiences when it's trying to go one way and so you have you tend to have more resistance or friction on a surface like rubber for example than a hardwood floor where we play basketball okay um, fluid resistance is what happens underwater and elasticity is with the therabands all right final slide of the day joint biomechanics um, we have four examples here lower back um, the most amount of lower back injuries according to this textbook happens in your lumbar and sacral region so I guess just a fun fact to remember um, these lifting belts if you have seen it before these are used to control that intra-abdominal pressure so you can spay sorry so you can stabilize your lumbar spine and um, basically your spine and the surrounding musculature when you're doing heavy lifting that involves your back 
Okay, and then the shoulders are very prone to injury because it has the greatest range of motion. Um, the knees, we talked about the patella, how it gives that mechanical advantage uh, for us. And then elbows and wrists, the biggest concern with elbows and wrists um, related to sports injuries is overhead lifting and controlling that is going to be very important. So that's it for today. Um, if you guys have any questions, please let me know in the comments down below. And I hope this video helped. Thanks.